of Christianity, we think of dogma and doctrine and statements and ideas of what we need to be believing rightly. Um, and, and we think that a lot of times religion is about getting the rules right. But as you read through Scripture, even some of the rules, even the prophetic texts, even those stories about, not stories, but the statements about what makes you clean or unclean, these things have a story attached to them. There's a story to everything. There's a story about everything. Everything has a story. My mentor, uh, Dr. Leonard Sweet, told a story one time. He said, if you were to go to my home, if you come to my home, and that's the cool thing is if you do a, a doctor of ministry program with Dr. Leonard Sweet, you get to go hang out with him right before you graduate at Orcas Island because um, that's where he lives. And he says, when you come, you're going to notice that there's not a single furniture or object in the house that does not have a story. Everything has a story. That made me examine the things that I have in my house. I think a lot of them do not have a story. <laughs> just went and bought it just because I like, needed it or I just thought it would be nice. But everything has a story in Dr. Sweet's house. They don't invest in objects or bring in items into the home that does not have a story to tell. So one day when his children, who are now all grown adults, when his children were little, he told them that we're not allowed to have anything in this house unless it has a story to it. So he challenged them, and he says, if you find an object or furniture in this house that does not have a story in it, you have permission to do whatever you want with it. And so kids who are at elementary school, when you say you can do whatever you want with it, they get pretty excited. So they were around the entire house and asked about every item. Does this have a story? What is this story about? What is that? And true to Dr. Sweet's word, anything that did not have a story, he was held to his word, was handed over to them, to the freedom of his children, to do whatever they wanted, and usually it meant complete destruction. So they had fun destroying things and doing experiments, but in turn, the sweet house became a treasure trove of priceless items, because you can't replace the stories. In the same way, there are stories of Easter. I found this thing on the internet, it's a picture of the origin of the Easter bunny. You see that? You sure about this? Right. That's a famous painting of Jesus, but you know, you did a little shadow of that, right? And this, there it is. That's how the Easter Bunny came to be. Um, and then, there's a story. That's not true, by the way. But anyways, uh, the, there's also stories of the origin of the Easter egg, right? And there's also stories of the origin of Easter. Why is it called Easter? Why isn't it called Resurrection Sunday? And actually, the Easter bunny, the Easter egg, and the, 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 the title Easter is all connected to the same story. Biblical scholars agree that Easter, apart from celebrating Jesus' resurrection, actually has pagan roots in Germanic and Anglo-Saxon history. It was a celebration of the goddess Esther, hence Easter, that coincided with the arrival of spring. And oftentimes, she was depicted in the form of rabbit. Symbolic of how rabbits are known to reproduce rapidly. Um, as spring is associated with new life coming out of the death of winter, this goddess Esther was a, a, a symbol of new life that was happening around. Well, when Christianity came into Western Europe, the people baptized this season, kept the name Easter, and put in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Such is our faith. There are stories that enrich the truth of what we believe. You know, Christianity is always appropriated culture. There is no, no more an original form of Christianity anymore. Because through the centuries, everywhere Christianity went, it adopted things about that culture, redefined it, and found the gospel in the midst of that. For example, even biblically, when Apostle Paul enters the city of Athens, he's looking for a way to connect the gospel with the people. So what does he do? He finds this temple called the Temple of the Unknown God. And he says, oh, that, that, that's, that's the Hebrew God. And he introduces the gospel story. Christianity has always done this, wherever it can, to spread the, the message of the gospel, because in, intrinsically, the gospel was, was, was really about trying to find a way for all the people of the earth to know Christ in the midst of their lives. Even the Christmas tree, it's not in the Bible, but it's the evergreen tree, an object of worship in German traditions, converted into a symbol of the everlasting love of God given in Jesus Christ. 
One very powerful cultural appropriation I learned last week was about Pacific Islanders and Samoans and using the coconut for Holy Communion. The coconut. You see, in island culture, bread and grape juice is not native food to them. So a pastor wanted to figure out what to do about administering communion that made sense. Because communion is not just a ritual that we do. It's supposed to represent Jesus Christ. It's supposed to represent the body and blood of Jesus. And it's supposed to be made of things that are common to us. Well, for the people in the island culture, bread and grape juice was not a common thing. And he wanted to make sense of the message of Christ's sacrifice, breaking his body and shedding of his blood. And the coconut was life to the people on the islands. There are 86 words, did you know? 86 words to describe the use of a coconut and the coconut tree. 86 different words. So the pastor decided one day to take the coconut, broke it, using the flesh of the coconut for the body of Christ and the coconut juice for the blood of Christ. And it was so powerful to the people who were receiving it. And it's actually powerful if you really think about it, even if you don't have any island culture. While bread and juice come from two completely different sources, the coconut for communion is breaking of one source. Out of the coconut come the substance and the liquid. Out of Jesus came his body and blood. By consuming the coconut, the people would have life. So these are the kind of stories of Christianity as it spreads throughout different areas of this world throughout history that it's been used in different ways in different times using different metaphors to communicate different things of the same story, the same confession that Christians have of Jesus Christ, that he died, he was buried in the grave, and he was raised on the third day for the forgiveness of our sins, for our salvation, and for new life. That's the resurrection account. And as we read through this resurrection text today, there are loads of stories to tell just within those eight verses. Now, who were these women? They're not just arbitrary names that were thrown into this story. But each of these characters have a story. I also love how the gospel writers make sure to write that it was women who first experienced the resurrection. Not the the men who are always front and center like Peter, James, and John. In fact, in the beginning, they didn't believe. They didn't accept it. And this actually, this point, makes the claims of the resurrection even more legitimate. Imagine if the disciples were trying to make up something and trying to convince the world about a lie, they would not use eyewitness testimony that was invalid during their time. But the gospel writers, they simply wanted to tell the truth. They weren't trying to scam people. So they took a risk. Really, they were taking a risk by putting women in the story and saying they were the first witnesses of the resurrection. If they wanted to put a scam, they would have used men and said it was the men who actually discovered this. But one of the most legitimate things about Scripture is that it is very different from how culture is preserved throughout human history. For instance, history is almost always written from the vantage point of the victor, right? Yet the Old Testament is filled with stories of failure and defeat. Because the purpose of the Old Testament was not simply to tell the story of Israel. Because if it was a history book only, then it would only record the the, the triumphs and the victories that Israel had. It would not record the plethora of failures and defeats and even the shameful things that the Israelites did. And yet the scripture is filled with it because it's not simply a story about the Israelites. It's a story about God and his redemptive purpose in the midst of our greatest, greatest failures. The gospel writers would not have recorded Peter's denial of Jesus or any of his foolish comments for that matter if they simply wanted to somehow advocate this new faith. They would not have written accounts of women who are placed at the forefront of the resurrection story. Perhaps we forget that reality, that they were telling the truth. Here's a funny comic I saw this past week. I don't know if you can see it well, but on the, on the left side are the women who saw the resurrection and the rest are the men. It says, so ladies, thanks for being the first to witness and report the resurrection. We'll take it from here. <laughs> but we know that's not the truth. You know, you, you, you look into the scripture that we read today. There's Mary Magdalene. 
There's Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and there's Joanna. Who's Mary Magdalene? She, she is, she is the, the woman who had seven demons in her and it was cast out. Jesus cast them out, and she became a major disciple in the Jesus movement. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, were, were, she was the mother of one of his disciples, a supporter of Jesus' movement. And Joanna is the wife of Herod, King Herod, King Herod's steward, Chusa. She was in, in the royal activity that was happening. And she was a person of prominent status. She is actually known to have funded Jesus' ministry. These are the stories of the people who are going before it was, it was it, before the sunrise at, at, the, at dawn. They're going to the body of Jesus. They're going to his tomb. And that's because Jesus was a part of their story. They're not just being faithful. It's not happening in a vacuum. There's stories happening here. Other gospel writers record some other women. Susanna, she was another one of the women who provided for Jesus' ministry. And Salome, who's the mother of the disciples, James and John. And did you know, is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So did you know that James and John are cousins with Jesus? Did you know that? Man, like I discovered this only last year, and I was blown away by it. I was like, my God, reading the Bible every day and telling the stories of Jesus so often throughout my life. But you miss it, that John and James, the son of Zebedee, the sons of Zebedee, were cousins, first cousins, or second cousins with, or was first cousins with, 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 with Jesus. Now suddenly when Jesus is hanging on the cross and says to John, this is now your mother, and says to his mother, this is now your son, it makes sense. He's saying, take care of your family. And there's Mary, the wife of Clopas. Clopas was the brother of Jesus' earthly father, Joseph of Nazareth. So this is really a family affair, right? When you have someone, a loved one who, 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 who passes away. Who goes to the tomb? It's close family and friends. They go. They go to the grave. And they go to be there, to mourn together. These were people who had their lives not only transformed by Jesus, but they had a close relationship with Jesus. Wouldn't you go to the tomb if you were them? It makes sense that they're willing to risk their lives. And they're going in the dark because they don't want to get caught. And yet they're going with trembling and fear. They're wondering, who's going to move this stone? And as they're going, they're expecting to find a grave. They're expecting to find a dead Jesus. But there's a sudden twist of events. As they go with certain expectation and they leave, they encounter something completely unexpected. There's a twist of events here. Nothing is the way that it should be. The stone is rolled away. The body of Jesus is not there. And there's two men dressed in dazzling apparel. Nothing is as they expected. But that is the resurrection. It goes against everything that we expect. And that's because we live with a mindset. We live in a world that functions off the system of death. Do you remember last week I preached a, a message about how Jesus res raises Lazarus from the dead. And as, he, as he's in front of the tomb of Lazarus, it says the shortest English verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. It's not just a, a tear that dropped from his eyes. It's a powerful outcry. It's an explosion of emotions, of anger against what the system of death is like. He's saying death should not be. This should not be. And I've come to fix that. And so he raises Lazarus from the dead, but Jesus' resurrection is so different from that. You see, Lazarus was raised from the grave only to die again one day. But Jesus would bring forth the resurrection that is completely irreversible. So when, the, when these women are going to the tomb and they're, 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 they're encountering this idea of, of resurrection, it doesn't make sense to them for a lot of different reasons. And the angels have to remind them, don't you remember what Jesus said? And yet it's still, it's still hard for them to swallow. It makes sense that Jesus raises people from the dead, but who's going to raise Jesus from the dead? But not only that, when he is raised from the dead, it's not the kind of resurrection or better yet, scholars will say the difference between a resuscitation versus a resurrection. Jesus wasn't resuscitated. He was resurrected. So the angels say this. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking, not for flesh life, but why are you looking for this 
God divine living among the dead. Why are you doing that? It's a question for all of us to ponder this morning. A lot of times we're so fixated on the things that are dead in our lives. A lot of times we're so fixated on the things that have dead ends and, and, and we hit a, a wall in our lives and we're just, we're just stuck there. And we're trying to find our way in the midst of that place. And yet we need to hear the voice of God saying to us this morning, why are you looking for miracles? Why are you looking for divinity among the things that are limited, the things that are dead? Why are you looking there? You have to look elsewhere. You have to look where God is at. You have to look where, where, where there's life. Look there. You'll find him. What did the people believe about Jesus' resurrection after all of this? I mean, it's so amazing. And they had to distinguish that, again, that resurrection is not resuscitation. It's not an undoing. It's not, you know, you have an undo option on your phone or your computer. That's not resurrection. It's not reversing. See, resurrection is permanent. It's a never-to-die-again immortal life. And I heard people say, and I don't know this because I haven't been there yet, but I heard that when you get to heaven, you'll look like what you did in your prime. Um, yes. <laughs> Second, it was not to be confused with the common view of the afterlife that Jesus had during Jesus' time. This is another reason why the people couldn't grasp what Jesus meant by resurrection. In Jesus' time, both Jewish and Greek thought were dominated by the idea that everybody went to the same place after they died. So everybody, when the Jewish, when you read through the Jewish Bible and you read about Sheol, this place called Sheol, it's a place whether you were good or bad, whether you were righteous or unrighteous, or you were religious or non-religious, everybody went to Sheol. That was the thought during Jesus' time. In the Hebrew Bible, it's called Sheol. Greek text like the Odyssey is called Hades. Both Jewish and Greek thought believe the same thing, that after you die, everybody goes to the same place. Now, the Hebrews, however, believe that when you get to Sheol, there's two parts. There's the good side, and then there's the bad side. That's why there's a story that Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus, they both die. They both go to Sheol. And Lazarus and the rich man are able to see each other across a certain void. If you, if you ever read this story, notice that they're able to see each other. And, and this rich man who is, is suffering in this bad part of Sheol is crying out to Father Abraham saying, can you please have Lazarus dip his finger in water and just give me one drop of water? They're in the same place. That's what the people believed during Jesus' time. And so people in Jesus' time actually wanted to do whatever it takes to avoid death as long as possible because we're all headed towards the same place anyhow. The body would rot in the earth. The soul would be in Sheol forever. These were the ideas of death. And yet they also believed in a resurrection at the final judgment. John 11, Jesus goes to Lazarus' grave and tells Martha about, you know, how do you believe that Lazarus can be raised? And he says, I know he will rise again at the final judgment. She's talking about an idea that had developed during, during that time, that there's going to be a final judgment when God's going to come back and set everything in order again, and all the good will rise, and they will be, be with God, and all the evil will, 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 will be punished for all eternity. So the idea of resurrection was understood through this lens. So the idea is that once you die, you still go to a place where you don't want to go. And you have to wait until many, many centuries and maybe thousands of years later when God finally decides to come back and restore everything and, and, and do this thing called the final judgment. So even the idea of resurrection was, well, I know it's probably going to happen, but it's probably not going to happen for a, a really, really long time. So when Jesus dies and he's raised from the grave, it's completely different. It's completely different. And then he goes into the grave, and he goes, as Peter records, he goes into, he goes into Sheol, and he declares his victory before Sheol. And he rises from the grave, and the gospel accounts show that as he rose from the grave, that same day that, that those who had fallen asleep, those who had died, 
the righteous people began to come out of their graves along with it. So finally, this real resurrection was happening. This real incredible resurrection that had never happened before. That spirit and body were reunited again and people were raised, being raised from the dead. This was happening and there, there were witnesses of this account. This resurrection was so unbelievable because there was nothing like it. So it required, it required heavenly beings to tell these women, don't you remember? Don't you remember? Don't you remember him saying this stuff? And so Luke says, and they finally remembered. Have you ever hit a dead end in your life? You know, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer in Jesus Christ. You forget. You forget. It doesn't matter how many miracles you've witnessed, you forget. But God reminds you, just like the angels today, don't you remember? Don't you remember? He said he's going to suffer, die, but be raised on the third day. Right? That's right. My Jesus is a God of resurrection. My Jesus is the one who conquered We just sang a song, lifted up, he defeated the grave, raised to life, our God is able. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in your faith? When you think about God, when you think about your life, when you think about Jesus, do you believe that, that, that my God, my God is able? He's able to do something with my life that is so different than anything else. He's a God of resurrection. He's not just a God of just restoring the things, the same exact things that I lost. But he's a God of redemption. He's a God of resurrection. He's a God of new life, not an increase of the old life. A lot of times in our faith, I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I come before God and I lost something or I'm losing something or I'm defeated in some way and, and I failed in some measure, and I come to God and I'm really asking, what I'm asking for God is to give me back that exact thing that I lost. But really what I'm doing is I'm limiting God and I'm not saying, God, would you resurrect this? Would you make this so much more and so much better? Would you pour out your new life into this? I want what you have for me. Not what I think, just a kind of uh, an undoing of what went wrong. What about you? What's your story? In this resurrection narrative, what's your story? We all are part of this resurrection narrative. When Christ was on the cross and he died for each of our sins, you were on that with him. There's a famous hymn that says, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Of course, we weren't there. That happened 2,000 years ago. But the, but the hymn is calling us by faith to say, were you there? Were you there? Your, your entity, your being, your sense of who you are, your faith, were you there when he died for you? But also, were you there when he, raised, when he was raised from the grave? What's your story as you go and seek on this journey of faith, this journey of life? These women were doing the same thing. They're, they're going to the tomb. They're, they're trying to figure this Jesus thing out. You know, he died. They, he was a friend. He was a teacher. He was their savior. He, they thought he was the Messiah and everything. You know, they, they had been very committed to this. And all that they once thought had come to an end. So now they're trying to figure this out. And maybe you've hit a dead end even in your spirituality, in your, in your life with God. Maybe you can identify but yet you're still going and you're trying to, 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 to navigate your way here. You've hit a dead end. But you are reminded just like these people. You are reaffirming your heart again. Yes, that's right. My God is God of resurrection. Yes, I remember now. I remember now that there's going to be problems and there's going to be failure. There's going to be even death in my life. But my God is a God of resurrection. Just as Jesus suffered and died, my life is going to have suffering and death. But that's not the end of the narrative. There's a resurrection. There's a resurrection. Between the, the agony of losing, between the agony of death and the resurrection, there is this silent period. You know, the Saturday between Good, the Good Friday and Easter is called Silent Saturday. It's a silence. 
And sometimes we need those silences. A great story has that pause, the lull of, now what? And you wait, and you wait, and you wonder. And I'm a big you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe fan, and if you saw Infinity War, it left you like completely in shambles and it makes you go, now what? There's this, it's not like the movie's coming out the next week, right? It leaves you in silence for quite a long time. And it's coming out this month, right? It's coming out really soon, and you're like, yes, I gotta get there. I wanna, I wanna watch this. I wanna finally get the real answer. But some of us, you know, we're, we're, we're well, not some of us, we're all in our journey of life, we, we hit those dead ends, we hit those points of failure, and we immediately want that resurrection, but it's that, it's that silent period in which we, 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 we wait. And there's that space for us to ponder, and we look, and we struggle. And there, when the resurrection happens, it is so powerful. And that may be your story today. Would you be reminded this morning that death is never the end? Dead ends are never the real end. But there's a resurrection for you. And even in this life, even if you do perish in your flesh, that there is a true, complete resurrection that will come as well. But along the way, there are these small little resurrections that, to keep us going. That what we, that's what we pray for and keep, keep reminding us of this great hope that we have, that death is not the end. So today I invite you, hear, hear God's angels saying to you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Come out of that place. Look for the resurrection. Don't dwell on the death. Eagerly seek him in the place of resurrection. Eagerly seek him in his life. And in his resurrection, in his life, you will surely find him. Amen? Let's pray.